Okay, it's about 8.02. So uh, as people continue to chime in on the webinar, why don't we get started? Because I know we have a, a large attendee list and you need to get through this information and onto your very complex days here. Um, boy, we haven't had this much activity on the COVID front in uh, several months during our pandemic in the workplace here. Uh, as you all know, and why you've uh, signed up this morning, Last Thursday, a very significant announcement was made by President Biden about mandatory workplace vaccinations for a wide variety of our workplace population. That obviously has triggered a significant amount of discussion about how this will be implemented, who's affected by it, um, what does this new OSHA pronouncement mean, how does it affect medical facilities, what about federal government employees and contractors and that sort of thing? Uh, a team of us here at Miller Johnson have been working through the weekend to try to get to the bottom of at least what we know so far. My name is Gary Chamberlain. Uh, on our webinar this morning is Hillary Skolton, Sandy Andre and Tim Gutwald to try to answer some of the questions and not only the questions of what we've anticipated but we've got a, a very lengthy list of questions that people have submitted to us in advance. So we'll try to field those on the fly as well. What we're gonna talk about this morning is just essentially the President Biden announcement last Thursday about requiring vaccination for a varied population of the American workers. Um, vaccination for federal workers, uh, the OSHA, planned implementation of requiring larger employers, as OSHA calls it, with 100 or more employees to be either vaccinated or have regular protocols such as testing and what does that mean, and also some sort of provision for paid time off to obtain the vaccination itself. Uh, Hillary and Sandy will be covering that ground. Tim's going to talk about regulations for nursing home workers, which has been expanded to other medical uh, facility workers uh, in terms of participating in Medicare and Medicaid. And then I'll uh, take the uh, tail end and talk about federal government contractors because there's been a, uh, a, uh, an announcement that there's an executive order in which federal government contractors, or at least some of them, will have to comply with these mandatory vaccination requirements as well. So with that, uh, let's get to the first heart of the matter about requiring vaccinations for federal workers. Uh, Hillary and Sandy are going to tag this, so I'm going to turn it over initially to Hillary Scolton to talk about the first uh, item on number one here. Hillary, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Gary, and uh, thanks so much to all of you for, for joining today. Uh, regardless of you know, how you reacted to uh, these announcements over the weekend, we know that we are all in the same boat here this morning, which is that nobody wants to be here. We are so ready to be done with this and, and put this behind us. Uh, I'm going to kick us off today talking a little bit about what uh, President Biden did with respect to federal workers, even if uh, you know, you say, well, the federal worker piece doesn't really pertain to me. We think that this is really interesting because um, many suspect, uh, and President Biden has even indicated that, you know, the, the way that they're going with the federal workforce is, is sort of a, a test balloon, and then they're rolling it out uh, into the private sector. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see what, what has happened here. So uh, let's, let's look back and remember where we've been. Uh, Executive Order 1391 one, uh, rolled out January 20th, 2021, protecting federal workforce and, and requiring mask wearing. Um, this was, uh, you know, established the uh, Safer Federal Worker Task Force. Um, this task force issues ongoing guidance to heads of agencies on the operation of federal government uh, and the safety of its employee. Uh, the policy was applicable only to the federal workforce and individuals interacting with the federal workforce. Uh, then, July 29, 2021, President Biden makes some remarks, uh, announces that every federal government employee will be asked to attest to their vaccination status. 
Okay, so not even necessarily requiring vaccines, but any employee who either does not attest or attests and is not vaccinated will be required to wear masks in the workplace, test one to two times per week, socially distance, and have limited or completely restricted work-related travel. So that was kind of how they started out those initial uh, restrictions for uh, federal workers. And you can see some similarities, as, as Sandy will talk to, uh, with the, the larger companies uh, and what Biden has proposed in, in those rules. So vaccination or testing. Vaccination, you know, they, they called it sort of a vaccination requirement, but really uh, there was an option to test. Um, President Biden announces that every, uh, oh, yep, sorry, let's move on to the next, uh, the next slide there. Yeah, there we go. Then we come to this next phase, September 9, uh, 2021, just last week, executive order um, requiring that all federal workers uh, and those who interact with the federal workforce, that they have to be vaccinated, removing that option to get tested. So the task force is supposed to issue additional guidance by September 16 on agency implementation of this requirement. So we're all waiting to see uh, exactly what that specifically will look like uh, in, in place. You know, what will, will there be, you know, any additional exemptions uh, allowed? Um, what does it look like for individuals to get time off? Uh, what is the compliance rate required? Um, you know, what kind of extensions are going to be granted? These are all the things that we're, that we're looking for. And we have a slide later on um, where we have compiled some of the top questions um, on the, really the forthcoming uh, rules that we anticipate for larger companies, which Sandy's going to talk about, but, but additionally for, for the federal workforce and contractors, et cetera. Um, from you, ones that we anticipate and, and we know that folks are trying to, to get answered. So we're gonna talk about that um, in, in a few slides as well. So just important to really know several things with the federal workforce. You know, the, the masking option has gone away. Vaccinations are required, but we do not have the implementing rules on this, which we expect on Thursday of this week uh, to, to guide the agencies who will be tasked with implementing this in their various departments. Yeah, so I wanna turn it over to Sandy now, but as I said, I'm gonna come back on in just a few minutes and talk about some of the potential legal challenges uh, which have been, been threatened uh, and, and some of the grounds on which those might proceed as well as some of the questions that we have from you. But for now, I wanna turn it over to Sandy who's gonna talk about uh, the forthcoming rules uh, from the Department of Labor on these larger companies in the private sector. Thanks, Hillary. Good morning, everybody. Yes. Yeah, so as Gary and Hillary mentioned right at the big announcement last Thursday that had many different parts. So Hillary's just covered um, what that landscape looks like for federal employees. Um, and Gary will talk about contractors. Tim will talk about certain healthcare employees um, or uh, facilities. And I am going to talk about um, this 100 plus employee OSHA piece, right? So President Biden's announcement talked about um, two pieces. He's directing the Department of Labor through OSHA, through that sub-agency OSHA, directing OSHA to develop a rule that will require all employers with 100 or more employees to ensure their workforce is fully vaccinated or require any workers who remain unvaccinated to produce a negative test on at least a weekly basis. So that looks a little bit like the old, and right as far back as uh, July, <laughs> right? The old rule that applied to federal employees is kind of what that looks like. But the second piece is directing um, the Department of Labor to develop a rule that will require those same employers to provide paid time off for the time it takes workers to get vaccinated or recover from post-vaccination effects. So the paid time off component is interesting for a number of reasons. Hillary will hit on um, some of those questions we have. Um, but one of the pieces, um, again, remaining open question 
question is we don't know exactly what that paid time off requirement will look like. Will it look something like um, the benefits that some employers have access to under the American Rescue Plan? Remember, some of you on the call this morning may still be taking advantage of those payroll tax benefits that are open through the end of this month, right? Certain employers that offer, and what I'm going to kind of call uh, air quotes, FFCRA like benefits um, to employees have the ability to claim a payroll tax credit through the end of September. So maybe that paid time off requirement will look a little like that. We don't know. The other piece it might look like um, is what the current OSHA ETS looks like. So if you remember, certainly if you are a healthcare uh, facility or healthcare employer, you're very familiar with the OSHA healthcare emergency temporary standard. Um, when that went into effect in June, um, that required employers to support COVID vaccination for employees by providing reasonable time off and paid leave, such as paid sick leave, to each employee for vaccination and any side effects they experience following vaccination. So using their own existing, right, paid time off programs, making sure those are available to their employees to meet um, uh, to encourage vaccination. So we don't know. We don't know. Um, but we've got at least those two pieces, kind of those two frameworks that we think it makes sense um, that OSHA might borrow from. So we'll keep it one of the many, many things we're keeping an eye on. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So let's quick just pause and talk about um, the ETS process a little bit. So the OSHA Act, so we're talking about federal OSHA, requires um, or allows right OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard um, when two, right, two requirements have to be met. First, employees are exposed to a grave danger from exposure to substances or agents determined to be toxic or physically harmful or from new hazards and that an emergency standard is necessary to protect employees from such danger. So to even right cross the ETS hurdle, OSHA has to make a finding that both of those prongs are true. You know, interestingly, um, and for those again who are subject to the healthcare ETS, you you may remember that Sarah Willie and I talked a little bit about this uh, back earlier this summer. Um, that in all of OSHA's history, right, there have only ever been nine um, emergency temporary standards issued before uh, this summer's COVID uh, healthcare ETS, and the most recent one was in 1983. So this is definitely um, very um, nuanced space that we're living in, and it seems um, crazy <laughs> that we're, we're about to get our second in just a handful of months when there have only um, been a handful um, since, since the existence of, of that federal agency. So this is something that's not that common um, because those requirements, um, those prongs are so, uh, require such a significant showing, right? Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next uh, uh, slide here. Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about process. So again, we talked about the OSHA Act gives the authority to OSHA to issue these ETSs without having to go through what we kind of call normal rulemaking. So normal rulemaking typically would require the department um, supplying notice and, or opportunity for public comment or public hearings regarding any type of proposed standards. So that's the typical normal process. Um, but in an ETS, you can kind of bypass that, again, as long as the department makes those two findings, right, those two prongs and can bypass that normal rulemaking process. Generally, those emergency temporary standards are immediately effective as soon as they're published in the Federal Register. Um, what we saw earlier this summer with the healthcare ETS, right, it was published, it was announced before being published in the Federal Register, um, it was like announced on June 10th, published in the Federal Register on June 21st, and then it had a rolling compliance date with that first compliance date being July 6th. So even though it's effective as soon as it's published, at least if uh, the past gives us any kind of breadcrumb for what the future might look like, it'll be some kind of ramp up before or employers are required to be compliant. At least that's what we believe um, will be will be what that looks like. And then, of course, as soon as that emergency temporary standard is uh, published and in effect on the back end, OSHA is actually required to start the full rulemaking process on a permanent standard with that emergency temporary standard serving as kind of the 
basis for the proposed rulemaking. So the ETS is out there, but on the backside, OSHA should be starting the regular rulemaking process um, for that ETS to become a, a, full, a full standard going through the normal type of vetting. Next slide, please. And so an emergency temporary standard is valid until it's superseded by that permanent standard, right? That OSHA should be um, promulgating kind of in the background. Um, and the statute requires OSHA to promulgate that permanent standard within six months of publishing the ETS in the Federal Register. Now, um, I don't know about you, <laughs> but I'm sitting here going, that sounds very unlikely <laughs> that a permanent standard would make its way through the process in, in six months, but I've been surprised before. Um, and what's kind of odd, right, with, the, with this entire process on the OSHA side is uh, the OSHA Act is not entirely clear on what happens if OSHA is unable to promulgate that standard in that six month time frame. certainly possibly open the door for legal challenges, um, but it's silent on what happens to the effect of the emergency temporary standard, right? Does it go away? Does it stay in effect until, what does that uh, space look like? So that's another a wait and see. We're making a list right on your notepad of the wait and see that list is probably going to be longer than we'd like it to be um, by the end of this presentation too. Um, so um, for us here in Michigan, as an example, there are more than 20 states across the country that have what are called OSHA approved state plans. Um, and so Michigan is one of those states. So if you're in a state with a state plan, those state plans are required to adopt or adhere to that emergency ETS. It, the OSHA standard is not uh, clear on how quickly a state plan state must do that. Um, and again, as we kind of look at the healthcare ETS as like a little bit of our breadcrumbs, we're still seeing um, various states with uh, federally approved state plans just now formally adopting that ETS, although they've been following it, following it all along. Let's go to the next slide, please. So where are we today, right? So probably like you, you heard the announcement on Thursday and you thought, oh my goodness, is this, this seems imminent. This seems like something has happened last night. Where are we? So um, good news, bad news, we're, we're nowhere different than we were before President Biden spoke, other than we know that he plans to direct OSHA to do this. I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news as we sit here this Monday morning, but there's a couple places is that we look, and I can promise, right, everyone on this call um, on the Miller Johnson side has refreshed their page about a thousand times even since we've been on this morning, just to make sure we haven't missed anything as we've been talking. So the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has a dashboard uh, for all regulatory activities that are going on. And so typically what we would expect to see is a Department of Labor OSHA rule submitted through that agency, and we could see where that is in the process. Process. And as we sit here this morning, there are no OSHA regula regulatory actions that are currently under review, so no new information there. Another piece that we can sometimes find um, some information is that we at least have some kind of agency pronouncement on what they're doing um, in response to President Biden's announcement and um, the DOL and OSHA, both of them, right, the larger agency and the sub-agency, both of them have had several news releases since President Biden's announcement last week week, but none of them have been about an OSHA ETS, so we're watching that. And um, as we look at the OSHA webpage itself, it's still listing, right, its newest items are being uh, the ETS for healthcare, right, which went back, which went into effect back in June, and this August 13th updated guidance for all employers. So those are the newest pieces on the federal OSHA page. Um, just in case something might slip in there that, that gives us a, a kernel of information. But that's all we can see as we sit here this morning. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's what we know in terms of where we, where we sit in the status of um, a potential ETS that applies to uh, private sector employ employers. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I'll kick it back to Hillary. Great, thank you so much, Sandy. That was uh, really, really helpful. And uh, you know, we, as we sit here, I see you know the questions continuing to to pour in uh, in in the Q and A. And as we'll get to uh, in the next slide too, we have already a, a huge list of compiled questions. But you know, it's really important to 
name and identify those questions. So we know uh, what we're looking to get answered, clarifications that you know, we will be pushing uh, to make sure it exist when the rules are, are forthcoming. Um, and also to know what we don't know yet and, and to avoid sort of jumping to conclusions or, or making assumptions about things uh, that, that we may have to do. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, the reactions and the potential legal challenges it's certainly been interesting to, to see um, employers, uh, you know, many large companies like Amazon and Walmart immediately jumped uh, and applauded uh, the mandate. I happened to be in a, in a place with a lot of uh, small business owners uh, on Friday morning after the rule came out, and, and I can tell you there was not applause uh, in, in this particular location. Um, there's a lot of concern uh, over the impact on recruiting workers. Anyone on this call knows how difficult it is uh, right now to get workers. And, and a lot of folks are really worried um, about the impact that might have. To the converse, many, many applauding this say this is going to help us. Uh, a lot of folks are afraid of coming into a workforce um, and a workplace where it's not safe or healthy. And this is, this is going to address that. Um, we know, uh, let's go back. Yeah, one more. There we go. Um, unions initially were resistant, but most now are, are turning towards embracing um, on the condition that the administration gives them a final stay. Uh, AFSCME, the American Federation of Government Employees, was the largest unions. Um, I think somebody is not on mute uh, on Miller Johnson. There we go. Um, so we, um, you know, will be monitoring that, of course. We know there's been a lot of lobbying activity by the unions for the administration to, to make sure that their voice is heard in a final say um, in the rules. We know that uh, at least two uh, states, Texas and South Carolina, their governors have already threatened uh, legal action. Uh, the Republican National Committee has also threatened legal action uh, against the, the, the president. Many think that you know, there's just no legal authority to, to issue rules like this. Um, and there's, there's really two potential main legal challenges uh, shaping up that we have seen. One is uh, just generally over this ETS process in general that, that Sandy had talked about, right? And so, so that would be, you know, the administration has to answer two basic questions. You know, is there a grave danger for employees in the workplace? And is the emergency standard itself necessary to, in, to protect the employee uh, from that danger? So, you know, does COVID present a grave danger in this particular workforce? And is the vaccine necessary to protect it? You know, uh, reactions among uh, you know, our colleagues in the legal field are, are really mixed uh, on, on this, uh, on whether a, a challenge mounted against it could, could be successful. Many, uh, as, as those who follow some of our litigation know, it will depend, I think, largely in, in where the challenge uh, is mounted, both uh, in terms of, you know, the, the court, the persuasion of the, the judges on the court, but also, you know, when you look at uh, the, the, the danger that COVID presents in that particular area. Uh, the second is with the paid time off component. Uh, Sandy alluded to this a little bit when she was talking about it, but a lot of folks are saying, hey, wait a second, OSHA doesn't normally have the authority to regulate the payment of wages. That seems a little bit improper for, for OSHA to be regulating this paid time off category. Um, and, and then also, you know, does the executive order conflict with congressional intent on this because Congress you know, recently decided that they were going to let, allow some of the paid time off provisions um, under the first COVID relief bill to expire uh, December 31st, 2020. And now here you have OSHA coming in and creating this new standard. So a lot of folks are saying, wait a second, that that doesn't really seem proper. So those are some of the things that we're monitoring. We know that, you know, folks are kind of getting ready and jockeying for position. But of course, you know, we don't have the rules yet. Uh, and that is one thing that we want to, you know, just com continue to reiterate, you know, we're, we're here today because we want you to be as prepared as possible, give you as much information as we have. Um, but we don't have all the answers yet because the rules um, are, are still forthcoming. And, you know, 
we let's move on to the next slide because I know one of the one of the top questions uh, is when <laughs> when we might see the rules and and that is the biggest question. Um, you know, it's it's my job here at Miller Johnson to help kind of keep our ear to the grindstone and and get uh, you know some some information. Uh, and and I do know these rules are are far along in the process. You know, this is not you know Biden is saying draft these rules from scratch. These have been in the works, and we are hearing that it'll be a matter of weeks, um, not months. Right? We had January when the president was like, okay, we're going to have this emergency standard. Then you know, five to six months later, you know, we actually see the rule. Uh, that's that's not going to be the case here. It's a narrow rule. It's shorter. We already have the example from the federal context, and we know that you know these these rules have been uh, in the works. However, even though under the emergency standard rules are you know they don't go through the normal uh, rulemaking process, they are effective immediately when published in the Federal Register. We anticipate and expect, and the administration has indicated that there will be a ramp up period to compliance, but we don't know what that will look like just yet. So that's one of the biggest questions we're trying to get answered for you. Again, uh, some of the other questions relate to definition. What does it mean to be fully vaccinated? Will this include boosters too? We know that immunity is, is really limited. Uh, how is, is uh, how will the rules define, uh, I'm sorry, that should say workers uh, or employees, full-time, part-time? I know somebody had a chat uh, on that in the question and, and the answer is we don't know that yet. That is a big one that we are really, really trying to get answered. What about remote workers, right? You know, a lot of companies have said, okay, you can go, you know, full-time, remote, they're not in the office, they're not necessarily posing a danger, but you know, they're, they're still workers. Uh, then we know that there is this violations uh, penalty, $14,000 per violation. Well, what is a violation? Is that each worker? each worker each day, uh, the, another, another large looming question. Uh, again, how long will companies have to comply? Not only what's that ramp up period going to be, but you know, say there is a violation, are you gonna continue to get fined every single day or do you get you know, another 30 day period uh, to comply? Then on exemptions and extensions, uh, you know, what happens if there is, you know, a, a certain amount of uh, non-compliance for uh, maybe say lack of testing uh, kits available, lack of personnel to take the tests or, or to put all this into place. And, you know, we, we wanted to note that there already is a temporary variance available uh, for lack of professional staff to implement an emergency temporary standard. So, you know, that's one thing that that we think we absolutely would be able to to see and ex, uh, expect and then you know the the last large question just being who pays for testing these questions are you know we we wish that we had them for you here today but without the rule in hand uh, we simply can't answer them but it is important i think for you to know and understand uh, that these are you know not foregone conclusions and and we don't have the answers uh, until we have the rule um, and and simply for your awareness that we are working hard to to get the answers to those questions and i know we're taking detailed notes on the questions that are already in the chat box. Please keep them coming. You on the ground uh, are, are thinking through this much uh, more clearly uh, and, and with much uh, more important attention to the relevant details than anyone in the administration, and we'd love to be able to pass them on. With that, uh, am I tossing it back over to you, Sandy? Uh, yes, for a couple more slides. Yeah, so this next slide, Hillary and I joked um, at the end of last week saying, well, maybe this whole present, our section of the whole presentation just needs to be these two slides. <laughs> There's nothing to do today and maybe we should all relax, but um, that's not entirely helpful. And right, we kind of talked about uh, the previous ETS and, and how long that took. Um, and just what we're hearing is we're not going to get right a kind of five, six month delay from the presidential um, kind of announcement that this is coming before something is happening. So um, we, we want to be able to give you some takeaways today, um, at least as it applies to the private employer 
piece. Um, one that you know that we're watching it and there's many questions that are unanswered, um, but we're asking them and you asking them to us is incredibly valuable too, so that we can make sure we can kind of account for some of the things that businesses are thinking about. Um, but we want to give you some practical, uh, practical tips too. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So even though we don't know when and we don't know exactly what, there are some things that you can start to do and start to think about, right? Just as Hillary mentioned um, that we have no indication that there's there haven't been any words written on a paper <laughs> related uh, to this ETS, even though it's, it's not effective today. Same goes for you um, in private industry, right? Just because we work, write the words on the paper today and start talking about it at a leadership level doesn't mean we have to roll it out to our employees uh, tomorrow. But knowing that that runway will be pretty quick, it makes sense to start thinking about um, process, right? Process um, that will make sense for you. So, um, right, what we know right now is it looks like vaccination or testing, right? So you as an employer want to start to think about, okay, do we have providers that we can identify to point our employees to for vaccination or testing? Start to think about that. The second piece is, do we need a policy for vaccination and testing that provides our employees some pieces of information about what this OSHA mandate will look like in your workplace, right? Who are the who's uh, that are going to collect proof of vaccination or proof of te negative tests? Who are the, right, who are the people that employees should be going to with questions? When and where should all of these things be happening, right? How often? Some of those logistical pieces. Um, Certainly right now, right, as we as we sit here today, um, we don't have any indication that an employer's obligation to consider requests for accommodations under the ADA or request um, for accommodations under Title VII, religious exemptions. We don't have any indication that those will not apply. Um, so we need to be thinking about what will that accommodation process look like, right? We probably need request forms. We need to identify um, the who or the department that is going to be in charge of answering employee questions about those accommodations, individuals who are going to be in charge of um, evaluating those requests and making individual determinations on whether those accommodation requests present an undue hardship for the organization, right? That's, that's employee specific, um, job specific, all of those pieces. And then what kind of communications do we need to our leadership team explaining the process so that our leadership can speak with one voice and, and um, talk to employees, coaching council employees to the right place and to the right person in the organization to get their questions answered. And then what kind of communications do we need to be drafting to our employees explaining this new policy, explaining um, how, how this process will work. And then of course, communications to employees um, that either grant any accommodations uh, they've requested or deny the accommodation they've requested and the reasons why. And so you need to start thinking about what that process might look like in your workplace to the extent that you don't have something like that already, right? We're 18 plus months into a pandemic. So I uh, fully believe that many of you have COVID-19 specific policies and have dealt with <laughs> Um, requests, uh, right, for accommodation under the ADA or religious uh, Title VII uh, religious exemption requests at some point during this pandemic. And so it's really buttoning those pieces up and thinking about if that process continues to make sense as it, as it exists or making modifications so that whatever and whenever this new OSHA ETS rolls out, you all are, you have the pieces in place to hit, to hit the ground running. Many of these, um, one last thing, and then I'll go ahead and kick it over to Tim. Um, many of these pieces, right, that I'm kind of flagging as being good ideas to start to think about, um, do exist in Miller Johnson's Resource Center. And the pieces that don't exist, um, drafts will be there before the end of the week, right? Um, so if you're sitting here going, I can't wrap my brain around any of that, Sandy, Hillary, and Gary, how, how dare you ask me to do that? Um, no fear, we'll have those resources available for you. Um, uh, so that you have a, a starting place um, that is a good jumping off point as you look at how this makes sense for your workplace, okay? 
And with Sandy, that Sandy and Hillary, this is Gary. Um, we've I've been scanning the individual questions here, and there was a lot of uh, commonality in what people are asking. So just in the interest of time, I'll sort of summarize one question for each of you, just to emphasize, I guess. Sandy, you talked about accommodation under <clears throat> ADA and Title VII for medical and religious. We've had a lot of people asking questions about that. And of course, that's a very significant discussion of its own. But we don't know anything so far under this OSHA ETS that suggests the accommodation process is any different just because of this than what we've already encountered maybe from a vaccine requirement by a health a hospital, for example, or a uh, mask requirement in a manufacturing environment or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, again, we have nothing to lean on other than right how this is kind of all, <clears throat> how we've gotten to the place that we are. And President Biden's own remarks <clears throat> talked a very little bit about potential exemptions, right? Legally required um, exemptions, I think is the term that he used, right? And so as we sit here as employment attorneys, to us that we know, right? For us, that means ADA medical, Title VII um, religious exemptions. And so we're not aware of anything um, other than those, but we're also not aware that those, those right? air quote, normal processes wouldn't also apply um, to this ETS. Good, and Hillary, if you're uh, monitoring this still, um, you discussed the pay for testing issue. There's been a few questions about what about the time off for the vaccination? Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming that, because a couple of people have said, well, we already have a policy that either gives time off for medical evaluations and treatment, or we specifically have a COVID-related policy for time off for vaccinations. Do we know anything more about that, or is that still something to come down the pike in what we expect September 16th or other guidance? Yeah, again, you know, I, I would say the, the most cautious uh, and prudent ap approach is, is let's wait and see uh, what we get. I think September 16 is also going to be pretty uh, telling there because that is, you know, that will obviously provide more guidance on the vaccination piece and what, um, you know, what the federal government is going to do in terms of that, that paid time off. Um, I am continuing to hear more and more that that is an area, uh, you know, I think that will likely be subject to a lot of litigation as well. As I mentioned previously, you know, folks saying, wait a second, that's not really OSHA's purview uh, to, to regulate that area. Um, so, you know, whether or not you can, you can use this, this already existing uh, paid time off or uh, a new provision, that is, is a detail that remains to be seen. Okay, thanks, Sandy and uh, Hillary. A lot of questions seem to gather around those couple topics. Yeah, there. and thank you so much again. You know, we're we're taking all these down. I've seen a few on here that um, I have not seen in any other uh, discussions or 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 being posed uh, to the administration. Um, so so thank you so much. Okay, let's kick it over to Tim Gutwald to talk about uh, health facilities and the impact of new rules expected there and Medicare Medicaid issues. Tim. Take it All away. right, thank you, thank you, Gary. Uh, I did want to voice a complaint that they that <clears throat> Sandy and Hillary used a Aaron Rodgers um, <laughs> meme format. There, he was my starting quarterback in fantasy football yesterday, which was a disaster. So a tough day. Um, I almost pulled it. I almost pulled it, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to go with Jameis Winston, didn't you? Uh, it was it was brutal, but uh, thanks for thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, a lot of what you just heard from from Sandy and Hillary, you know, is relevant to healthcare providers. You know, these issues around paid time off for you know for getting vaccinated is important. The questions related to exemptions under the ADA or, or religious exemptions are also applicable to healthcare facilities as well, and and healthcare. Um, providers more broadly. So um, so I want to thank them for that and kind of build off of that. Hopefully, I'll try not to cover too much, overlap too much with them. But again, so along with these other um, part of the plan, I guess I should say, that Biden announced last week was a mandatory vaccination for healthcare facilities. 
CMS issued a press release. And so again, CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies <clears throat> announced it is developing regulations to require vaccination at health facilities. So this is an expansion of the previously announced requirement for nursing homes. So uh, last month, a few weeks before Biden's new plan was announced, CMS had stated that there was going to be a requirement for nursing homes that all staff members become vaccinated. And this builds on uh, prior regulations that CMS had released for nursing homes that dealt with educating staff, tracking who's been vaccinated, tracking vaccinations, reporting that information to, to CMS or to the federal government. So um, this is somewhat, somewhat familiar ground, a little bit more familiar for healthcare facilities than it is for, for other employers. But um, so again, so this is an expansion of what was previously been announced. The, it's likely to come as additional conditions of participation. Uh, I'll try not to get too deep in the weeds since I know we have a lot of, a lot of employers who are not healthcare providers on the line. But the, you know, these are regulations that uh, entities, healthcare providers must meet in order to be enrolled and bill Medicare and Medicaid. So that's how CMS addressed vaccination reporting and the education requirements. They, they snuck those into infection control conditions of participation for nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities. So the, I anticipate that's how they will approach this as well. Uh, the new regulations are expected in October. There will be a, a comment period. So keep an eye out for, for obviously those, for those regulations. I'm sure we'll have a follow-up webinar uh, if and when those come out. Uh, it's always important for providers to give their input for these types of final regulations. Um, there was no details in you know, any of the announcements, the documents that the, the government released on enforcement, but typically conditions of participation, you know, they're enforced through plans of correction. So um, the way this works is a surveyor comes in to a healthcare facility. Uh, there's, again, a whole host of regulations that providers uh, are required to comply with that go obviously well beyond simply vaccination requirements. Uh, those are, you know, they'll look at paperwork, they'll do physical inspections, all that kind of stuff. And, and then it cr they create sort of uh, uh, the survey report that identifies areas that need corrections, the hospitals or other healthcare facility issues, you know, produces a plan of correction that is approved or whatever. There's timelines for when compliance must be demonstrated when a resurvey may occur, you know, it, for particularly risky issues, there's, you know, they can suspend or even exclude healthcare facilities from Medicare and Medicaid. It seems unlikely, um, you know, given most of my clients have already, you know, well down the road on um, vaccination efforts with employees, a lot of health, a lot of health hospitals and health systems here in Michigan, uh, announced, you know, a month or plus ago, um, pretty, for the most part, somewhere a little bit before the final approval of the FDA, the full approval of FDA, the Pfizer vaccine, and some happened right after, but there's already been a number of clients of mine who have already mandated, mandated vaccination, especially in, you know, like the hospital or health system setting. So, um, you know, I, I can't imagine we'll see a lot of exclusions related to this, but it'll be interesting to see um, what, um, you know, what difficulties come up. So next slide, Gary. Again, so the scope of the new requirement. So this is, you know, one of the areas where we're getting some questions and I'll address one of them that I saw already posted. So this is going to apply to healthcare providers that are healthcare facilities and enrolled in Medicare and, and Medicaid. So that's going to be the tie-in. You know, I have clients who are concierge medicine practices or, um, uh, telehealth type clients that may not bill Medicare and Medicaid, in which case this is unlikely to apply to them. This again, when I'm saying this, this is specifically with respect to the healthcare regulations that were discussed. And the other requirements that relate to employers will um, almost certainly apply to healthcare employers and healthcare entities, regardless of their contract status with or participation in Medicare or Medicaid. <clears throat> and so then the other component of this is healthcare facilities. And that's where, you know, there, there is a little bit of ambiguity in the announcements. There is no official definition of what that means. The press release and um, some of the other documents provided by the administration and from CMS did provide, did list a few different type of entities that helps us, you know, draw some conclusions about where the line is likely to be drawn. So again, they mentioned hospitals, dialysis facilities, 
ambulatory surgery centers, that's what an ASC is, home health agencies, nursing homes that were previously announced. You know, and, and one of the commonalities about all of this, about all of those uh, entities that you see listed there, is that they'll have their own individual provider number with, with Medicare and Medicaid. So it seems likely that that will be um, sort of the, one of the dividing lines. Also, these entities have conditions of participation that they must meet. Uh, there's, you know, regulations under them that that they must meet. Again, home health agencies, which makes me wonder if, um, you know, what other type of entities that that might be included. So, you know, hospice entities have. Uh, specific regulations and conditions of participation they might meet. They're very similar to home health agencies, so I wouldn't be surprised if this requirement is going to apply to hospice. And again, if you think about, you know, from sort of a common um, sense perspective, ho uh, hospice entity is going to be around very vulnerable people because they're going to be sick. And so, again, I, I would I would anticipate that hospice entities would be included. What I wouldn't see, you know, one of the questions we had is from an employer here in the chat was, hey, we bill Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so, you know, we're not a healthcare provider, but we provide billing services that bills Medicare and Medicaid. Well, is this going to apply to us? And at this point, my, I think that's unlikely. I think medical groups that are sort of like outpatient providers uh, are going to be, ex are, are not going to be included in this as, as well. One of the reasons under this specific healthcare requirement, again, the government and CMS announced that this is going to be through some healthcare regulations, and there's just less of a mechanism um, for CMS to uh, enforce those and to to bring those regulations, apply those <clears throat> regulations to, you know, an independent practice group. And you know, we work with uh, dermatology practices in town, ENT practices, uh, anesthesia and radiology, and those type of outpatient, you know, it's unlikely to apply to you uh, as a sort of outpatient medical group. Again, if you're going to be going into hospitals that I'll, I'll touch on here right now, uh, your, your providers are likely to be impacted. So again, it's expected to apply to more than just employees, you know, contractors, even volunteers. And one of the interesting aspects of the, the press release and some of the initial um, documents provided by the administration is that it's not going to be narrowed just to clinical staff. So, you know, you walk into a hospital, you see, you know, you need your parking validated, or you need to ask, how do I get to room such and such? There's often a volunteer sitting at like a, a help desk or a reception type desk. And it, it, based on the initial um, guidance or documents information we have from, from the administration and CMS, it looks like, you know, this is going to apply to even those volunteers Obviously, you know, it's going to apply to, you know, I mentioned, you know, we have we represent medical groups, if those if they have providers that are coming in and treating patients in the hospital, you know, there's going to that mandates going to apply to them as well. Um, via the hospital that they have, you know, say medical staff privileges on or a contract with. So I think, you know, if you're an, if you're an employer, a healthcare group that really, you know, primarily provides outpatient, you're not part of a health system, you're not part of a hospital, um, you're not an ambulatory surgery center, I think you need to, to evaluate what kind of relationships do we have with those entities? Are we sending staff there? Uh, and and it, if you are, then it's certainly at least those employees are, are going to be required to be vaccinated. And so, you know, if the, if the other rules under that they've announced don't apply to you, and so you think you're out from under the uh, vaccination requirements or the testing requirements, again, um, you mm -hmm. might have to reevaluate that. It'll be interesting too. I have a number of clients who provide on-site clinic services for larger employers, right? You know, particularly in factory or industry type settings, employees sometimes are injured. And so it'll be interesting to see um, whether or not that kind of connection is going to require you to mandate or to, to vaccinate your employees. All right, thanks, Gary. All right, so what to do? Kind of building off what Sandy and Hillary, they asked the same question. So 
you know, maybe nothing. A lot of healthcare facilities already require vaccinations. They, they might have a policy in place. Again, healthcare facilities are, are generally pretty familiar with how to navigate some of these ADA uh, and religious exemption issues as well, because they have historically required the flu vaccine. And so they often deal with employees requesting exemption. So, so maybe this isn't quite as disruptive or um, difficult for those type of those entities, particularly our hospitals and health system clients. Um, but well, CMS did mention two specific things facilities can start can start doing immediately. One is education, and they can hold general education and inform informational sessions for staff. Um, and, you know, this is something that nursing homes have already been required to do. I kind of referenced the previous uh, regulations that came out under sort of the infection control guys. Uh, another option is to hold targeted sessions for departments or locations with low vaccination rates. Um, I, this has happened. This happened early on when the vaccine came out. Some employer, a lot of employers in the healthcare field already kind of started doing that. Another option uh, relates to clinics you know, hold vaccination clinics or provide time staff off. So we kind of discussed, Hillary and San Sandy mentioned the um, OSHA's uh, um, statement that, you know, employers are going to be required to provide time off. Again, that might not be quite as disruptive. Oftentimes, health, a lot of our providers are able to provide those vaccinations right, you know, directly in one of their own offices. Um, but, you know, a lot of staff don't work in those offices necessarily. So um, I think, you know, there, there might be some policies that need to be updated around that. And again, especially if, you know, as far as holding clinics or providing time, staff time off, um, this is, there's going to be a requirement, there's going to be a, a mandate that all staff be vaccinated. And so incentivizing that, making that easier for staff to do will help you um, reach whatever that requirement ultimately is going to be, even though we don't know exactly what that requirement is going to be at this point. All right, next slide. Again, so policies, you know, verification and documentation. How are you going to, to verify who's been vac vaccinated? Uh, how are you going to document it within your own system so that when those surveyors come around or however CMS decides to enforce this, you're going to be able to demonstrate to um, those surveyors that you have met this requirement, met this new regulation. Uh, Sandy and Hillary kind of touched on this as well. You know, think long terms. Boosters, how, how are those going to play into this? Think about new employees. You know, are you going to change orientation um, process? Are you going to are you going to change you know your contracts for physicians to re explicitly require this this vaccination? A lot of times, you know, there's already broad enough language in contracts that this might come in, but um, you know, you're going to want to make it clear again. Contracts as well. You know, if you have contracts with outpatient with a medical group, if you're a hospital. Um, and they come into your hospital to perform services, or if you're that medical group, you know, you're going to want to be prepared to address how is, is this going to be specifically mentioned in our contract? Is there language already in there that is going to make this apply to us such that if we have employees who are resisting, um, you know, is that going to put that contract in danger? You know, medical staff bylaws, medical staff policies and procedures. Again, it was very clear uh, from the CMS press release and, and the initial documents from the Biden administration that this is going to apply regard not just to employees of hospitals and health systems. So again, these are other documents that might need to be updated, need to be looked at and revised to incorporate this additional um, mandate. Um, forms, again, Sandy and Hillary address on this accommodation <clears throat> requests and forms, medical and religious exemptions. Most, uh, most hospitals or healthcare providers, again, are, are pretty familiar with this. They've been through the ringer on this when it came to the flu. So um, that shouldn't be as, as disruptive as it is for other, other clients of Miller Johnson. Again, the process, you know, receive document, how you're going to receive documentation substantiating the vaccination or negative test status, uh, you know, for healthcare providers, you know, I'm not sure that testing option doesn't look like it's going to be there. Maybe that's not the case, but, you know, if there's a religious exemption or a, um, an accommodation for one of your employees, are you going to require a negative test? Will, um, you know, 
will the will OSHA provide guidance on payment for that? And can you can you get payment from the government for that um, for those employees? You know, and again tracking. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, receiving and evaluating accommodation requests, communications to employees, you know, you're going to want to get ahead of this. I'm sure, you know, there's already lots of questions that we're receiving from clients, especially for those who healthcare providers who are under 100, who don't have healthcare, who don't have um, relationships with hospitals or uh, a healthcare facility that's clearly going to be covered. You know, uh, employees are going to wonder if this applies to them. Uh, if you're a large health system or hospital, again, you're going to need to consider communicating with, you know, volunteers, contracted staff, independent staff, um, others outside of strictly the employment, the employment context as to, um, you know, whether or not this is going to apply to them. One of the questions I saw um, prior to starting kind of my, my portion of this presentation was you know the interaction between this requirement and the OSHA requirements that were just addressed by Sandy and Hillary? Um, you know those relate to 100 employees. There was no employee limit uh, in this. So if you're an ambulatory surgery center and you have you know 30, 40 staff members, or maybe you don't even have that many employees because you do a lot with via contract, you know mm -hmm. this is still going to require this is still going to apply. And again, it's going to apply regardless of, um, uh, it's going to apply for ASCs, healthcare facilities, and it's going to also apply to you if you're with, if you're kind of contracted with those entities, if you're going to show up at those entities. And also, you know, I focus a lot on uh, healthcare providers here, but I, I do want to emphasize if you're providing other type of staffing services, if you're providing, um, if you cook meals or custodial services for an ASC or a hospital, then um, it looks like these are going to apply to you, even if you're under 100 employees. So um, those are the kind of questions. If you have any sort of relationship, especially with a healthcare facility, especially with a hospital, an ambulatory surgery center, a nursing home, um, you should be considering, all right, this, this probably is going to impact you um, and, and start thinking about providing education because you don't want to be caught off guard to have a, you know, a big client or a big, a big contract of yours um, showing up and saying, hey, um, you, know, you, you need to have your staff vaccinated or we're going to terminate this contract. So those are, the, those are kind of the main things we know right now. Uh, I'll kind of look through some more of the Q&As and if there's more, Gary, maybe you saw some already. But if there's more um, moving, you know, that I see moving forward, we can maybe jump on a few of those at the end. Quick, I'm going to wrap up very quickly because we're we are almost approaching our hour limit here. The last piece of the puzzle today is what about federal government contractors? Uh, and I'll, I can quickly get through this because we're almost at our nine o'clock time here. Um, federal contractors have wondered. Does this apply to them? Because President Biden announced a separate executive order aimed only at federal government contractors last Thursday as well. And of course, that's a, a big question because the federal government spends in excess of $500 billion a year buying goods and services, parts, pieces, and stuff from the private sector. And especially for those businesses who may be federal government contractors or subcontractors with less than 100 employees and aren't in the healthcare uh, arena, uh, the implication has been that there's a separate executive order that will require mandatory vaccination by those businesses of their employers, uh, employees as well. And whether or not those contractors have been invited to the mandatory vaccination party is sort of an open issue and there's been a lot of misconception. So I wanna, I wanna clear that up. Uh, last Thursday, President Biden and his press conference along with the OSHA obligations that are coming down the pipe suggested that a very broad man, vaccine mandate would be required for employees of all federal government contractors. Again, as a way of expanding the reach of vaccination of adult workers in America. Uh, and announced that he would issue an executive order that would implement these mandatory vaccination requirements on federal government contractors without any more detail than that. And frankly, a lot of media has picked that up because even this morning, 
On the radio, I heard a story about mandatory vaccination of all government contractors. I heard it on the TV news last night. And so that sort of mantra is being repeated in the media. Frankly, I've seen lots of human resource blogs, trade journals, legal articles even, that have suggested that all federal contractors have to comply with mandatory vaccination. Uh, in fact, I even saw a story this morning about a very large federal contractor who said they were going to immediately implement mandatory vaccination, not because of the OSHA requirement that is expected, but because of the executive order for federal contractors. And honestly, I think uh, a number of businesses and certainly the media have not read the executive order because it is frankly far narrower than what the media seems to be reporting right now. Even the uh, president's, uh, you know, the, the written documentation, the Bible, so to speak, issued last week as well, the path out of the pandemic, the action plan, very generically implies that federal government contractors, meaning private businesses that do business with the federal government, will be subject to a mandatory uh, vaccination requirement for their employees. And again, uh, without belaboring it, it's frankly far narrower than what most people seem to believe. I think most businesses, at least those with at least 100 employees, are going to be ending up far more uh, consumed by the OSHA requirements than the federal government contractor executive order. So in other words, there's a widespread belief that all federal contractors are subject to it. Not so. What exact details are going to be covered? We're not sure. Clearly, some federal contractors and subcontractors will be covered by a mandatory vaccination obligation. Uh, but there are very few details on what that encompasses. Again, the same questions about paid time off for the vaccination, who will pay for testing if employees aren't vaccinated, are going to come very soon uh, in just uh, another week to 10 days or so. President Biden did issue an executive order last Thursday about federal contractors and mandatory vaccination. And it sort of ties in with what Hillary was talking about earlier in our presentation today about federal government employees. Um, there is a policy guidance from a couple months ago that required vaccination status, or as Hillary said, for federal employees, if not vaccination, then repeated testing, social distancing, and masking of any federal contractor worker who was working on site at a federal government facility. Meaning, of course, a federal office building, a federal courthouse, a federal prison, a military installation, and that sort of thing. And this was intertwined with the federal government's safety initiatives about transitioning federal workers back into the office after spending about a year and a half in remote work. For example, if you had an EEOC charge, you know that EEOC investigators were working from home for a very long period of time or working remotely anyways. And this is part and parcel of that because it's um, the executive order is executive order on assuring adequate COVID safety protocols for federal contractors. It really doesn't even require mandatory vaccination at this point in time. It just talks about a general policy approach to battling COVID-19 and so indicates that vaccine requirements and incentives of certain federal contractors and subcontractors will be required. The details, however, are not going to come down until the Safer Federal Worker Tax Force, uh, which was established earlier this year, uh, publishes some sort of vaccine requirement on September or no later than September 24th. And again, the Safer Federal Workforce Task Force was developed earlier this year to uh, amongst among other types of obligations to help sort of shape the policy framework for federal employees eventually working their way back into working on site at federal facilities. Some sort of mandatory vaccination, vaccination requirement will be required of a very limited 
population of federal contractor and subcontractor workers. We'll know a lot more about exactly the you know, twists and contours of that in just uh, 10 to 12 days by September 24th. But what has not been publicized at all really so far, other than the fact that um, there's been some publishing that the earlier executive order on federal contractor minimum wage and federal contractor sick pay are, is sort of the framework for this mandatory vaccination executive order. But if you read the executive order from last Thursday, it applies to a very narrow and very limited set of federal contractors and federal subcontractors. And probably most of you who are watching this webinar, it does not apply to. Frankly, there's about a quarter of the American businesses who are subject to federal contractor obligations. About 25 million American workers work for federal contractors that would otherwise be subject to a wide variety of things such as affirmative action plans and that sort of uh, obligations. But the minimum wage coverage has been the model framework for this executive order. And right in the executive order, it says that it only applies to four different types of federal government contractors. One, if you have a contract, which is a procurement contract for services and construction or real property, which essentially means you're, for example, covered by the Davis-Bacon Act for federal government construction, you may be covered by this. Contracts for services covered by the Service Contract Act, for example, services provided to the federal government, for example, workers in a assisted living facility or a nursing home giving skilled nursing care or even home care to military veterans under a contract with the Veterans Administration, you may be covered by this. Contracts for concessions, which is really limited, meaning you have a a deli stand or a snack bar or a newsstand or a barber shop in a federal office building or in a the lobby of a federal courthouse, for example, or contracts entered into with the federal government in connection with federal lands offering services to the general public. For example, you operate a restaurant or a uh, canoe uh, or river rafting tour service in a national park or something like that. So this is actually very, very limited. Construction contracts, service contracts, concessions, federal property. Um, in, under the earlier executive order for minimum wage, which is the framework for this, uh, the federal government has said, this will enhance minimum wage for hundreds of thousands of private sector workers for federal government contractors. That is a extremely small slice of contractors because about 25 million American workers actually do work for federal government contractors. Um, it does apply to new contracts entered into after October 15 or an existing contract that's renewed or extended with a federal agency or the military. But more importantly, it does not apply to manufacturers or suppliers of goods and that are generally produced and sold to a federal agency or the military, such as the vast majority of federal contractors who produce office furniture, microchips, computers, automobiles, cruise missiles, stuff like that that is sold to the federal government, because that is not Davis-Bacon construction. It's not a concession stand. It's not services on federal property, and it's not Service Contract Act work. It's mostly not applicable to manufacturers of hard goods sold to the federal government. And it explicitly in the executive order says it doesn't apply to federal grants or employees working outside to uh, the United States. And again, the coverage says in it multiple times, it's similar to uh, minimum wage uh, executive order, which has been around for years as it was passed by the Obama administration. It also says, however, if you are one of those four limited businesses, federal Davis-Bacon construction, service, concessions, services on federal property, it applies to any employee working on 
or in connection with a federal government contract. And what does that mean? Well, I guess we don't know quite yet. Uh, we're gonna have to wait till September 24th with the Safer Federal Workplace Task Force publication, whatever they come out with in terms of the parameters of that. And also it doesn't apply to every federal contractor's uh, employee. It's not widespread across the entire workforce. It only applies to an individual who's actually working on the federal government contract. So for example, there's about a 20% rule of thumb. If you have someone working on a production line, manufacturing office furniture to be sold to the federal government on a federal government order, if an employee sort of flexes around a variety of <clears throat> uh, production lines, if they spend at least 20% of their time on that covered workforce, uh, covered uh, business, it would be considered covered. But again, since manufacturers aren't generally covered by this executive order, that wouldn't even apply. I'm just using that as an analogy. But if someone is working 20% of the time in a concession stand in the federal office building, then they would be considered an individual working on a federal government contract. Or the term in connection with, which again borrows from the minimum wage executive order, someone who does support roles that allows another employee to work directly on the contract could be covered by this because in connection with a federal contract encompasses support functions such as security, maintenance, custodial, that sort of stuff, et cetera. So the other aspect is certainly enforcing a vaccine requirement on only a portion of your workers is gonna be a very difficult human resource challenge if you don't implement something like this across your entire workforce if you are one of those very, very limited organizations who is covered by this stuff. So bottom line, um, it's a very narrow slice of federal government contractors to whom this is applicable in the first place. If it does apply to you, um, you have a decision to make about in terms of, do you only enforce it on those employees who are working directly on or in connection with the federal contract? Or do you, on a policy basis, enforce this across the board? And what are the twists and turns of what the details are in terms of who pays for testing and all the other questions that you had on the OSHA piece of this webinar? We'll know a little bit more on that on, on September 24th when the rules are issued. And with that, we've come to the end of our content piece. We wanna remind you what Sandy was talking about earlier about the Miller Johnson Resource Center, which has a wealth of uh, material uh, historically related to COVID over the last year and a half, but also will encompass the more recent uh, groundbreaking stuff related to the OSHA healthcare and federal contractor rules as well. And before we sign off, since we're well over time, because I've been speaking here for a few minutes, I'll just throw it back to Sandy, Hillary, and Tim to see if there's any particular questions we should tackle at this time, or have we uh, gone a little bit too far over time for this? I think all the questions oh, we have are excellent questions, but I'm, I'm not sure, sure if we Sandy's have speaking, the answers. I think just you're still yet. muted, Sandy. I think all the questions we've received are excellent questions, but we don't have answers just yet. So <laughs> we appreciate, um, folks putting them in the Q&A and they're really helpful for us so that we can pose them um, to, to the officials we have contact with to hope to get some clarity for you all. All right, and with that, we will follow up on some of the questions which are uh, generalized uh, to the extent that we learn answers to those questions and can provide a little bit more precise guidance to you all. And again, as Hillary and Sandy and Tim has said all along, I'm sure we'll be providing some more webinar resource materials to you as soon as we get some more precise answers. And with yep, that, I was just going to say too. Yeah, we'll we'll send out client alerts as we get updates as well, and of course we'll plan to to reconvene as we as we get more information. So, uh, thank you so much. Thanks, so well, thanks, Gary. Thanks for everyone joining us this morning.